Welcome to the 14th Distinguished Professor Seminar Series, a monthly event presented by the University of Colorado's Boulder Campus Retired Faculty Association. I'm Bob Grossman, retired from the Department of Atmospheric and Ocean Science, speaking to you from my home in Norwood, Colorado. These seminars showcase the best minds the university has to offer among an internationally recognized teaching and research faculty. Tonight's speaker will be Professor Cora Randall, former chair of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and a world-renowned research scientist exploring the atmosphere at the edge of space using remote sensors. She is also a fellow of the Laboratory of Atmospheric and Space Physics at the university. This introduction to the seminar is a particularly proud moment for me as I get to inform you of the extraordinary history of CORA's and my department. The current Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences began with five atmospheric scientists embedded in the Department of Atmos uh, Astrogeophysics in the mid 80s. Doctors John Hart, Gary Thomas, Bill Blumen, Julius London, and me. We were dreaming of having an atmospheric science department at the university. Key to that dream success was our choice of Dr. Peter Webster to lead the effort, becoming the department's first chair. We, with Professor Webster, began and nursed an almost 10 year process that has resulted in a world-class research and teaching department granting degrees from BS to PhD and spanning just about every aspect of the atmospheric and oceanic sciences. Professor Randall is a good example of a dream come true and then some. So thank you for letting me be effusive. Please note that Dr. Professor Randall's talk will be recorded and available on the CU Retired Faculty Association website where you registered for this talk. Professor Randall may also post additional resource material with a recording for those interested in further information on her topic tonight. I now turn the seminar over to Dr. Lynn Harvey, who will be Professor Randall's interlocutor and will introduce the speaker. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box. Dr. Harvey will pass them on to Professor Randall. Thank you, Bob. And it's my honor to introduce Cora tonight. Cora was born six of 13 children and grew up in Indiana. Many of her siblings are doctors and lawyers and her 90 year old mother made the local news this winter when she donned a pair of figure skates and made a few laps around the ice. The point is the bar was set high from the beginning. Cora attended the State University of New York College at Purchase for her undergraduate studies where she was torn between a bachelor's in chemistry and a bachelor's in music. And you'll get a sense of that duality in this talk. She got a BS in chemistry and I'm grateful every day that she chose to go into science. She went on to UC Santa Cruz for her graduate studies and received a PhD in chemistry doing biophysics, looking at the spectroscopy of proteins. She then did a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon in theoretical physical chemistry, focusing on molecular orbital calculations. She moved to Colorado to work at LASP on the Hubble Space Telescope and do work with comets, leveraging her knowledge of spectroscopy. She then shifted from Hubble to remote sensing instruments that measured the temperature and composition of Earth's atmosphere. She served as a member of multiple satellite instrument science teams working with instruments actively orbiting Earth. For the last two plus decades, she's been passionate about energetic particles from the sun and quantifying their impacts on the atmosphere using both measurements and models. For the last 10 plus years, She's also been the principal investigator for the Cloud Imaging and Particle Size Instrument, or SIPS, that's orbiting the Earth on a satellite called AIM. SIPS is a really expensive camera, and it takes pictures of clouds in the mesosphere. Seeing ripples in these clouds inspired her to want to better understand small-scale waves and their propagation in the atmosphere. So in the last few years, she's led a NASA Drive Science Center tasked with studying atmospheric waves and their impacts on the thermosphere and ionosphere. Given Cora's illustrious career, it's no surprise that she was elected AGU Fellow and Fellow of AAAS, an honor bestowed upon only two one hundredths of a percent of members. 
But most importantly, Cora has an ability to explain complex topics with the utmost clarity. Thus, I guarantee your enjoyment of this seminar by a distinguished professor in CU's Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Department, Cora Randall. Thank you, Lynn. Um, that was a very nice introduction. Thank you, Bob, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I hope, Lynn, I can live up to <laughs> your introduction. Um, so yeah, I am going to talk about what I'm calling the ignorosphere. I'm actually not the first person to call it the ignorosphere. Um, it's part of the atmosphere that, that directly connects the Earth's surface and space. Um, so the ignorosphere is really the mesosphere. That's that part of the atmosphere. Here you can see uh, the different layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere, where we live. Above that, the stratosphere, then the mesosphere, then the thermosphere. So the mesosphere itself is, say, 31 to 62 miles above the surface of the Earth. The reason that it's the ignorosphere is it's too high for balloons or planes. It's too low for satellites. It's located above the ozone hole that most of you have probably heard a lot about. Um, it's below the northern lights. So you see the beautiful aurora while you're looking at the thermosphere, not the mesosphere. And rockets shoot right through the mesosphere usually. So it's the often overlooked middle, which of course corresponds to its name, mesosphere. But often the middle is the best part. One of the things about the mesosphere is that it reaches the edge of space. So you may recall last summer, uh, Sir Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos both decided to, to fly up to try to reach space. They both made it. Um, at least according to different criteria, um, 80 kilometers or 50 miles above the Earth's surface. This is in the mesosphere. That's where the FAA would award you astronaut wings. Um, 86 kilometers, again, in the mesosphere, about 53 miles. Uh, Branson made it up to that altitude. The mesopause, which is the, uh, the very top part of the mesosphere, but it's kind of a, a broad region depending on the, on the season, it tops out at around 100 kilometers. Um, this is the Kármán line, um, where the pressure is only about a millionth of what it is at the, the Earth's um, surface. So this, this area here, uh, between, say, 80 kilometers and 100 kilometers, is usually what people consider to be the edge of space. Then you can go all the way up to 107 kilometers, where you're in the thermosphere, and that's where Bezos actually got to last summer. Another cool thing about the mesosphere is this is where meteors ablate. So when you see shooting stars, you're actually looking at the mesosphere. Another thing that you can see in the mesosphere are noctilucent or night shining clouds. Actually, you probably usually need to be at high latitudes to see them, although people have seen them at, at lower latitudes, including in Boulder. Uh, but they, they appear in the polar mesosphere in summer. This is a picture here of what they look like. You can see they're very beautiful, uh, shimmering clouds, really beautiful, complex patterns in them. They're also called polar mesospheric clouds, or PMCs, because they occur in the polar mesosphere. So I'll, throughout the talk, I'll be uh, referring to both noctilucent clouds and polar mesospheric clouds. They are the same thing. So here is just uh, a quick outline of the rest of the talk. Hopefully I've tantalized you now so that you don't immediately leave. Um, first, I'm just gonna be talking about this NASA mission that Lynn had introduced, the Aronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere or AIM. I'll talk about the importance of noctilucent clouds or PMCs and also a little bit about the AIM measurements. Then I'll go into talking about atmospheric gravity waves their effects on the polar mesospheric clouds and also effects on what we're calling atmospheric teleconnections. Then we'll look a little bit at space weather effects on the atmosphere, followed by a slide of summary and a slide of conclusions. So one of the things about noctilucent clouds is that you cannot see them from the ground during the day. There's just too much scattering of sunlight by the sky. But because they're 50 miles above the surface of the Earth, we actually can see them as long as the sun is a little bit below the horizon, but still shining on the upper atmosphere. So you can have the sunlight coming in, it hits the cloud, and then can bounce that light, scatter it back to your eye, as long as you are in shadow. So you can see the clouds a little bit after sunset and a little bit before sunrise. Satellites, on the other hand, can see them all day long. 
So that's why we launched Aronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere, or AIM. So this is a NASA satellite mission to study polar mesospheric clouds and their environment. It's the first mission that was ever launched just to study the clouds. And one of the reasons that we uh, were selected by NASA is that we were asking whether or not PMCs could tell us anything about our changing climate. And you might wonder how could something in the mesosphere really tell us about the, how the climate is changing, but I'll go in and uh, try and explain that. So starting with some of the history, the noctilucent clouds were first observed in about 1885. This was shortly after there was a violent eruption of the Krakatoa Island volcano. This went off in 1883. Here is a pen and ink drawing of, uh, of what the volcano looked like at that time. This other one is not actually a photograph of, from 1883. This is actually a photograph of the, the Tonga volcano that went off earlier this year. The Krakatoa volcano uh, released the equivalent of 200 million tons of TNT. By comparison, we think that the Tonga volcano released only about 30 million. So this was a huge volcano. You've probably been hearing about it in the news, but it wasn't even nearly as large as what we believe Krakatoa was. The important point really about both of these volcanoes is that the, um, they inject water into the mesosphere because they're from islands or, or below the ocean. So the fact that the Krakatoa volcano injected water into the mesosphere, uh, well, Krakatoa actually did it all the way up to the mesosphere. Tonga probably only got maybe, maybe to the very bottom of the mesosphere, but um, we think that that is why people were first able to observe the clouds in 1885. So after 1885, the clouds did disappear, but then starting around 1900 or so, they've been increasing ever since. They also were being observed at lower latitudes than ever before. So the question that we were asking is whether or not these changes are being caused by human activities. And you might say, okay, well, why would human activities have anything to do with clouds in the mesosphere? So there are two reasons. One is carbon dioxide. So this plot here shows how carbon dioxide in the orangish curve and actually methane in the blue curve have changed since 1860. So 1860 to nearly the present. And you can see, of course, the big increase. This is probably familiar to, to all of you because that's what's causing our uh, climate change, the um, CO2, the greenhouse gases. Um, so more CO2 causes warming at the surface. But up in the mesosphere, it actually causes cooling. It's a radiatively active gas and it, it releases heat to space. And there is such low pressure up in the mesosphere that, that the radiation that it releases can escape to space. So it cools the mesosphere. That's important because in order to form clouds, you need low temperatures. Water vapor has to condense and form ice. So as long as the mesosphere is cooling, it means you're going to be forming more clouds. Similarly, uh, but for a different reason, methane, if when we increase human emissions of methane, we also get more, uh, more clouds. And that's because methane is the source of water vapor in the mesosphere. So if you have more water vapor, you're also going to have more clouds. So both of these human activities, the emissions of carbon dioxide and the emissions of methane were, were um, hypothesized to have uh, caused the increase in polar mesospheric clouds and their movement to lower latitudes. So AIM was launched on the 25th of April, 2007. Um, it was launched on a Pegasus rocket, which is kind of a cool way to launch satellites. You can see the rocket underneath this, this huge plane. So the plane takes off and then the, the Pegasus rocket is, is actually dropped uh, below it and then ignited and it takes off into space. The AIM satellite was up in this cone area here. AIM carries three instruments. One is the Cosmic Dust Experiment, CDE. Uh, so as the name says, it measures cosmic dust. This is important because the hypothesis when we launched was that cosmic dust or meteoric smoke, the same thing, um, actually served as nuclei upon which water vapor in the mesosphere would condense to form the clouds. So we wanted to test that hypothesis. 
SIPS instrument. This is the one that I'm the PI on, the Cloud Imaging and Particle Size Instrument. Um, it is, as Lynn said, it's, it's a very expensive camera. It's actually a set of four cameras. Um, we look down on the earth and we take images of the polar mesospheric clouds. We also measure gravity waves in the atmosphere. And then the third instrument, SOFI, the Solar Occultation for Ice Experiment, it measures environmental variables that are important for the clouds, in particular, temperature and water vapor. It also measures actually the clouds themselves, but it doesn't take pictures of them um, and some other parameters. So just to give you an idea of what the clouds actually look like from either the ground or from space, on the left here is the view from the ground. So somebody just has a camera up and take a picture of the sky, and this is what you might see. In space, this is what we see from the AIM SIPS instrument. So this is actually a day of data. Um, happens to be the 26th of June, 2021. What you're seeing here is a polar plot. So the North Pole is in the middle, 50 degrees latitude is on the outside. And you can see this is, we actually call this a daily daisy because these look like petals on a daisy. These are actually just the orbit strips where the, it, the satellite is passing over the earth. And it does that about 15 times per day. Um, and all in here, these of course are just the images of the clouds. So each day you get to, you cover the entire pole and can see the clouds that might be forming there. Um, okay, so we're going to take just a quick interlude here. Um, this is a picture, of course, of Albert Einstein, and he's famous for this apparent, and he quote, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. So for those of you who are cast in the mold of Einstein, here is a music video for you. Um, the song was composed and performed by a group from NASA called the Chromatics. Um, in order to highlight the uh, AIM mission. The video was actually put together by uh, Chris Jeppesen, who works at CU um, LAST, Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. And Bob, I'm looking at you, so please tell me. Like 
Okay. So moving forward. All right. So if we were going to forecast the weather for the summer polar mesosphere, you can imagine what it would be. It's going to be cloudy. Oh, excuse me. With a chance of waves. Um, sorry, this is a cartoon actually from the children's book cloudy with a chance of meatballs. It's also been made into a couple of movies. But anyway, it is, it, it will be cloudy most of the time throughout the summer um, with waves. And so I wanted to introduce the concept of gravity waves. We've remarked about that a little bit. Um, they're waves for, for which the restoring force is buoyancy. So that balances the gravity. Um, so here's a picture of the polar mesospheric or noctilucent clouds. You can see all this structure in here. Well, that's really caused by gravity waves. So gravity waves are, are formed in a number of different places in the atmosphere, but when they're formed at the surface, they might be formed from different weather events, um, turbulent weather events, such as maybe thunderstorms, um, hurricanes, uh, just bad weather. Um, they also can be formed by wind flow over mountains. So you might have wind that, you know, air that's coming up to a mountain, it has to go somewhere it rises. Well, air that's rising is going to expand and cool. If it cools, that means water vapor can condense. So it can form a cloud near the top of the mountain. The air then goes back down the mountain, uh, pulled by gravity, it compresses and warms, okay? Um, just like in a, in a bicycle pump or something. And when you compress the air, you're going to warm it up. So air will descend, warm, but then it wants to rise again. So it comes back up, it cools, forms another cloud. Um, and then it's gonna be pulled back down by gravity. So it goes back down, then it wants to come back up again, forms another cloud, et cetera. So you get this line of clouds, um, depending on you know, whether or not the, the wave has caused the air to cool or to warm. And that's why you see this kind of thing here. You'll see that you know cold, low temperatures, you'll see the cloud and then there will be warming and then you'll see another cloud and then there will be warming. Um, if you live near mountains, you might see these in the form of lenticular clouds, you know, that you might see a line of lens-like shapes in their clouds going uh, from the mountains. So that's basically what gravity waves are and how they affect the atmosphere. Um, so we said that clouds form in the summer polar mesosphere. And the reason is because this is actually the coldest place on Earth. So here you can see the temperature profile of the atmosphere, temperature on the x-axis, altitude going up. Here in the troposphere, the temperature decreases with altitude. It increases in the stratosphere because of ozone. It then decreases in the mesosphere. And here at the mesopause, the top of the mesosphere, it's very, very cold. But you might say, wait a minute, it's colder in summer than in winter? Why would that be? Normally, of course, you would think that it would be warmer in summer. And the reason is because of gravity waves. So in order to understand this a little bit, um, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the physics, but, but some of it, you need to, to um, at least um, understand a little bit about the concept of wave drag. So waves carry momentum, right? They're, they're traveling through the atmospheres and they have momentum, just like you would have momentum if you're running down the road. Um, that, that momentum, when the, rave, when the waves break in the atmosphere, that momentum is imparted to the atmosphere as drag, okay? So waves break and they, they impose this drag on the atmosphere. I put this in quotes because it can, it, it's, you think of drag as slowing down a wind and that's true uh, in some cases, it actually can also speed up a wind. So, so you just, it's a little bit unfortunate nomenclature but that's what we use. But basically, if the breaking waves are traveling in the same direction as the wind, then they're gonna strengthen it. So you have wind, you then have waves that are traveling in the same direction as that wind, that means that you're gonna strengthen the wind. If the breaking waves are traveling in the opposite direction though, then you're gonna weaken the wind. So you have wind here, you have waves that are, that are going opposite it, that going, is going to lead to the weaker wind. Okay, so I'm gonna hand wave here. Fundamental laws of physics require that most of the gravity waves that break in the summer polar mesosphere are gonna impart eastward drag on the mesospheric wind. So here's a picture of what's going on. You don't need to worry about most of this picture. The point I really wanted you to take home from this is that 
Over here are eastward directed gravity waves. They enter the mesosphere, and this is where most of the drag is. There's some coming up on the other side too, westward waves, but there just aren't as many as over here. So this is where you get most of the drag. Okay, more hand waving, more physics laws, and really, this really is just fundamental physics. Um, they're going to require that this, this drag causes the air to rise in the summer polar mesosphere. So you've, you've affected the, the horizontal winds, but that actually changes the whole circulation of the mesosphere. So what I'm showing right here is what we call the meridional circulation. So this is the north-south circulation in the mesosphere, um, but also ascending and descending in the polar regions. So what happens because of gravity waves is you get ascent in the summer hemisphere, transport over to the winter hemisphere, and then descent in the winter hemisphere. So, whoops, sorry about that. Sorry about that, hit the wrong arrow. Um, so, so the important point I wanted to get across here is in the summer, you're getting ascending air, right? It's going up um, in the summer hemisphere. Well, rising air expands and cools, right? So the air keeps cooling off. The expansion and cooling then is gonna make H2O condense like we've already talked about. So that'll condense into ice and form lots of PMCs. So that's basically the idea of why we get polar mesospheric clouds at the uh, summer poles because of the, the direction and the imparting of momentum from the gravity waves to the mesosphere. Uh, the AIM-SOFI instrument shows that because it's so cold up there near the, in the summer polar region, ice is ubiquitous in the summer near the top of the polar mesosphere. So this plot just shows you measurements from SOFI, they're measurements of ice. The colored region just means that there's ice there. And you're looking at the summertime period as a function of altitude. This is in the upper mesosphere. And you can see throughout <clears throat> In pictures of the clouds, we can show that the, oh, the polar mesosphere is cloudy most of the summer. And unfortunately, it says that my internet is unstable. So I hope things you're still able to see my, my talk. You're okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so, so we show that the polar mesosphere is cloudy most of the summer. I've already introduced you to this kind of a daily daisy. What I'm gonna show you now is uh, progression throughout a, a particular summer. Um, Okay, so, so we have the daisy here. I'm gonna show you how it changes on a daily basis from the 1st of May through August into the first couple days of September. And what you're gonna see here is it's rotating around. This is just because our orbits change position from day to day. You're gonna see the clouds start appearing in late May. The date is down here. Um, so it's coming into June, clouds are increasing, but you can see they're already really filling this polar region. And you're going to see it continue to fill all sorts of structure, you know, patterns in the clouds themselves, but basically filling the polar region through July. And then you're going to see them start to decline into August and then throughout August. And the season usually ends right around the end of August when the uh, temperatures start actually rising again in the, uh, um, in the mesosphere. Okay, so, so the mesosphere is you know, very clearly cloudy throughout the summer. There are interesting patterns in the clouds that we've already talked about. So the SIPS images are often showing evidence of turbulence near the surface. So the gravity waves themselves, of course, they control the overall circulation, making it very cold up in the mesosphere, but they also control fine scale structure in the mesosphere. So what you're seeing here is a picture of some data from um, an instrument called AIRS on an aqua satellite. It, it can measure things like clouds and temperatures. And you're seeing an, a region of a lot of turbulence in the troposphere. This picture of a cloud just shows what, what was happening at the time, a big, big thunder cloud. Uh, gravity waves were generated here and they propagated up into the stratosphere. So this is an image of waves. You can see these patterns also taken by the AIRS instrument. Those waves propagated even farther up into the mesosphere and AIM detected them in the, in the polar mesospheric clouds. So these patterns here are generated from, they're the same waves that were actually generated at the surface here. So, so the turbulence at the surface can generate gravity, gravity waves that propagate all the way up into the mesosphere that we then detect. 
The gravity waves uh, result in all sorts of structures. They, they actually uh, cause fractal patterns in the clouds. Um, you can see rings in the clouds, partial rings, and, and other you know, interesting looking structures, all from gravity waves that are causing those patterns, regions of cooling and warming that are causing these, these interesting shapes. Another point of interest is space exhaust. When it drifts to the pole, the PMCs are going to increase. So this is just a depiction of a, or a photograph of one of the shuttle launches. Uh, the phenomenon I'm talking about here does not only require a shuttle launch. It can just be any normal rocket. Um, the shuttles tend to have a lot more exhaust than other rockets. Uh, but what happens is we, we've been able to show that that uh, prior to a launch, you may not have any clouds, but then when the space exhaust, which contains a lot of water vapor, drifts up to the polar region, you then will form clouds because of the water vapor. So this is just a, a map. It's actually a map of Scandinavia. It's hard to tell, but this is actually the, the border of Norway. Um, this is uh, on the day uh, right before a space shuttle launch. And then this is the day after launch where all these colors show the clouds that were depicted by that were uh, detected by AIM. And like I said, this happens with other rockets as well. Okay, so the mesosphere, um, I'm kind of switching topics right here. The mesosphere is a natural laboratory for studying atmospheric teleconnections. And what do I mean by teleconnections? It, in this case, what I'm talking about are perturbations in one region of the atmosphere that are communicated to remote regions, even to the opposite hemisphere without any you know, structural transport um, via interactions between winds and waves. So uh, in other words, we're going say from something, some, some variation that happens at the North Pole, you know, from the polar bears all the way down to the South Pole where the penguins are. Um, so this, this is, you know, like I said, there's no actually structural um, thing here that you can actually see that, that you would say, you know, there's no bridge that's actually taking uh, responsible for these teleconnections. Here is one example, though, of what we see. So this is, example is showing a connection between the Arctic winter stratosphere and the Antarctic summer mesosphere, um, where we've seen variations in clouds that actually were triggered by something that happened on the whole, you know, opposite side of the globe. So what this plot shows is days during the summer, this is relative to the summer solstice, uh, June 21st. Um, well, depending on what hemisphere you're in. Um, this, these, uh, the black curve here shows variations in the polar mesospheric clouds as a function of time, okay? Um, this actually happens to be the, the PMCs were actually detected in the Southern hemisphere uh, summer, so it was in uh, December to February of 2007-2008. The gray curve, which you can see is very, very closely you know, matching the black curve, is actually the wind in the stratosphere in the northern hemisphere polar region. So, so it's, it's a whole world away from where the clouds are. But you can see that it's, it's a fantastic correlation between these. We've shown that you know, by using models that it's not just a correlation, it's actually a causation, where day-to-day -day changes in the PMCs in the summertime polar mesosphere are actually triggered by wind changes in the wintertime polar stratosphere. This is in a matter of days between the two things. Yeah, so maybe you're saying, you know, is it magic? Well, maybe you're not saying that, but <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's not an, an unreasonable question given that there's no structural uh, bridge. It's real, but it can be as complicated as a Rube Goldberg contraption. But we're going to try and go through a little bit. I'm not going to go through all the details of the physics, um, but it, and, and there have actually been a number of different proposals for how these connections work. And it looks like there are probably several different mechanisms that, that pertain at different times, but I'm going to go through one of them at, at least at a high level. So it starts with the polar vortex. So the winter stratosphere has a vortex. It's defined by strong eastward circumpolar winds. So eastward meaning they're going toward the east. So this is just a depiction of what the vortex looks like. You have these strong winds, they're planetary size and scale, they're enormous, um, that are just you know, going around the globe toward the east. 
planetary waves. It's just another kind of wave like gravity waves, except these are, these are much larger. They're not forced in the same way. Um, they basically are forced by land-sea contrasts. Um, but these planetary waves come up from the troposphere and they break in the stratosphere and here they deposit westward momentum. So remember we said that the waves are going, the, sorry, the winds are going eastward in the winter stratosphere but now we're depositing westward momentum. So again, this is gonna, this is gonna impose in part drag on the winds. So the wave drag, since it's in the opposite direction, not only does it slow down the winds, but it can actually cause the vortex wind to reverse direction. When this happens, along with maybe a couple other things, it, it's called a major stratospheric warming. It, the stratosphere actually does start to warm at the same time. Okay. The reason this is important is because of that wind shift. So again, we're gonna, I'm gonna hand wave a little bit and say fundamental laws of physics. Um, before the winter stratus, be, excuse me, in the winter stratosphere, before the stratospheric warming, you have gravity waves that in this case are actually mostly coming up in a westward direction, okay? But when that winter wind reverses, then more of the eastward gravity waves are gonna get through to the mesosphere. What's going on here is this wind, which is this solid line here, it actually stops waves from propagating up. So you can look at this picture as saying, this is the speed of the wind in the eastward direction. This is the speed over here of the wind in the westward direction. Westward waves get through here just fine because there's no wind blocking them. But in the eastward waves, only some of them get through. They have to be very high speed. Um, but then when the wind shifts, things change. So now the eastward winds get through, waves get through, but not the westward. Okay, so what happens? That means that we've just added eastward momentum from these gravity waves that, that break. So this is now in the mesosphere, eastward, more eastward gravity waves are breaking. They're imparting eastward momentum. Okay, what happens if we make wind move in the, toward the east? Well, it has to be balanced by the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect, you might remember from high school or physics or college physics classes, it's gonna turn the wind to the right in the, northern, in the northern hemisphere. So basically you get this eastward wind that is then turned toward the equator. Okay. So this, remember, is the circulation, the, the whole circulation of the atmosphere, the meridional circulation. Um, we just said that we're getting equatorward flow in the winter, okay? Well, that's not how the circulation wants to be, right? The circulation says that it's supposed to go summer to winter. That's what the gravity waves have done. Uh, but now we're saying because of these planetary waves mixing with the gravity waves, mixing with the winds, <laughs> we're actually gonna slow down this, this circulation in the winter hemisphere. So if you slow that down, the air still has to go somewhere. Excuse me, I hit my mouse. And it's being blocked from wind coming from the summer is trying to make it to the winter hemisphere. This is going slower. So the wind, the air just, just starts to descend. As it descends, it compresses and warms. So you get warming of the tropical air here. Okay, we have in the summer hemisphere, remember clouds, the summer mesosphere, clouds form at the pole because it's so cold. So the equator in the mesosphere is warmer than at the pole. If we warm the tropical air even further, then we're just gonna increase that difference between the equator and the pole, the difference in temperature or the, the temperature gradient in the summer hemisphere, okay. Well, when you change a temperature gradient, you're gonna change the winds because air wants to flow from the warm part to the cold part. So that means you know, air wants to go from the equator even more, wants to flow from the equator into the summer, toward the summer pole. But again, you have the Coriolis effect that you have to take into account. That's gonna change it um, so that it, it actually in the Southern hemisphere, it's gonna turn it to the left of the direction of propagation. I know this looks like it's going to the right, but if you were a, if you were thinking about a parcel that was traveling with the wind, it's it would actually be to your left. So the Coriolis effect means that you have an east, you actually accelerate the eastward 
wind, which is already what's going on in the summer hemisphere. So you're speeding up the summer wind. Okay. So here is the summer wind right here in this dark line. Here are the waves that are coming up from the surface. We don't get very many westward waves because they break where the wind is too strong. These eastward winds are coming up, so they're making it to the mesosphere just fine. But we just said we're going to speed up the mesospheric wind. So when we speed up that mesospheric wind, we block some of those gravity waves from getting through. Right. So you so you have um, instead of breaking up here where they used to, they're now breaking at lower altitudes and not in the PMC region itself. So this is going to reduce the gravity wave supply to the PMC region, which means that overall there's going to be less ascent at the summer pole because it was the gravity waves that were making it have so much ascent in the first place, which was what was causing it to be so cold. Okay, if you have less ascent, it means you're going to have less expansion of the air. So it's not going to be as cold, which mean, means that less H2O is going to condense, which means you're going to form fewer PMCs. Okay, that is a very complex mechanism. Um, maybe you got some of it. <laughs> um, that's really a question, you know, did you get it? Or is it so much like this uh, Rube Goldberg that it really is kind of hard to get? Um, I certainly <laughs> have had a hard time remembering it all. And in fact, um, uh, we actually had to write a song to help us remember the steps, which I'm going to play for you in a minute. The basic idea here, though, is that for teleconnections, really the, the point that I wanted to get across is that they occur because winds and waves interact with one another. They connect the winter weather at the Earth's surface to summer weather in the mesosphere and on the opposite side of the globe. Like I said before, you know, I, I explained one mechanism um, at a very high level, but and there are several other mechanisms that have been proposed. I don't think we necessarily know all of them yet, um, but it's, it's a fascinating and current area of study. So going on to our picture of Einstein um, being a, if he were not a physicist, would be a musician because he thinks in music. Um, yeah, so again, we, we found this to be so complex that we really did have to write a song to, to remember the steps in the process. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to show you next. <laughs> Near the summer pole where the air ascends high above the land and seas. The expansion makes H2O condense, forming lots of PMCs. It was launched to study how they form, why they change, and what they mean. Will our changing climate skew the norm? What can Sips and Sophie glean? Oh, polar mesosphere, your clouds cry out to me. As they only show when the sun's down low, a wondrous sight to see. Sipsy's evidence of turbulence, fractal patterns, rings, and more. Sophie shows us his ubiquitous, and sees meteor smoke galore. Oh, it's face exhaustives to the pole, the PMCs increase. But when gravity waves assert control, those PMCs might cease. Oh, polar mesosphere, your clouds cry out to me. As they only show when the sun's down low, a wondrous sight to see. Stratosphere has a vortex with strong winds. But when waves come from the troposphere, a strat warming begins. This reverses how the mean wind flows, more gravity waves get through. Meridional circulation slows and temperatures they change too. Teleconnection, is it magic? No, it's real. As the winds and waves they interact with new Goldberg appeal. Tropical air begins 50 miles high in the sky. This accelerates the summer winds, reducing gravity wave supply. Now there's less ascent at the summer pole, high above the land and seas. Less expansion means it's not as cold, forming fewer PMCs. 
Anyway, okay, so I am going to move on to a slightly different topic at this point, um, talking about how the mesosphere is really a conduit for space weather effects on surface weather and climate. And by space weather here, really what I'm referring to is forcing from the sun and the magnetosphere. So the mechanism that um, I wanted to point out uh, is electrons and protons from the sun and the magnetosphere, they what we call precipitate, rain onto the atmosphere. And in so doing, they can produce ozone-destroying molecules in the mesosphere. These molecules are called NOx. They're odd nitrogen. It's actually NO and NO2, nitrogen and oxygen. Um, but they destroy ozone. Okay, They're produced in the mesosphere, but then they descend inside the wintertime polar vortex. And when they reach the stratosphere, they will destroy ozone in the ozone layer. So, so the, the space weather, which is, you know, in this case, we're talking about the electrons and protons coming down from the sun and magnetosphere, they will actually create reactive molecules in the, in the uh, mesosphere. Those descend into the stratosphere where they destroy ozone. Ozone is a radiatively active gas, so it can change the temperature. If you change ozone, it can change the temperature. So changes in polar ozone will change the temperature in the polar region, but not in the equatorial region. And these electrons and protons, they precipitate into the polar regions through the polar vortex. So you're changing the temperature in the polar vortex region, but if you change it only in one region and not in the other, then you induce a temperature gradient, which is gonna change the winds. And as we've already seen, winds and waves interact. So you can actually change an entire circulation of the atmosphere through this effect. So the result, at least in theory, is that, that through space weather effects that you're gonna actually strengthen the polar vortex. Um, and the polar vortex itself is connected to the, the troposphere and affects weather at the troposphere. So the hypothesis is that, um, that space weather can actually uh, decrease the number of cold air outbreaks in the troposphere. The mechanism is um, somewhat speculative. The important point though, is that um, these, any hypothesis like this can only be tested if we pay attention to the mesosphere and actually have measurements of the mesosphere. mesosphere. Okay, so I have reached a summary slide here. Um, after this, I'll just have one conclusion. Um, so polar mesospheric or noctilucent clouds, they reveal clues about the nature of the atmosphere. Uh, meteor showers supply the nuclei for PMCs to form. We were able to show that with the AIM mission. Um, human activities impact the mesosphere. This was a hypothesis. That was why we were launched. We've actually been able to show it. Um, rocket launches lead to PMC formation, uh, but also PMCs are increasing. They're appearing at lower latitudes. They've actually appeared as low as Los Angeles. Um, and this is because emissions of CO2 and CH4, the CO2 causes cooling, the CH4 causes an increase in water vapor in the mesosphere, both of those cause increases in clouds. Um, PMCs are connected to surface weather via gravity waves. <clears throat> gravity waves are also responsible for teleconnections between the summer mesosphere and the winter stratosphere. <clears throat> And finally, the polar vortex triggers pole-to-pole -pole teleconnections and communicates space weather to the surface. Okay, so we so we only have one atmosphere. It's all connected. I think that's probably you know, one of the big points that I would want to get across here. So in conclusion, then, you know, much of the behavior of the atmosphere and really our climate system is dictated by interactions between winds and waves. Unless you pay attention to the entire atmosphere, not just one part of it, you're just gonna get a partial picture of what the underlying physics is. 
So the mesosphere definitely should not be ignored, just like the blind bend in the elephant. You really need to see the whole elephant, not just part of it. So thank you very much for listening. We did get one question in the chat. Bob, it was you asking Cora, would the increase of water vapor and methane in the mesosphere cause clear sky IR temperatures to increase? Um, I'm assuming at the surface. Yeah, if it's clear sky, so you're looking at the surface, so you're wondering if, for instance, the Actually, I'm not sure if you're, are you wondering if the cooling in the mesosphere would, would somehow cause the, uh, the surface temperature to increase? Uh, <clears throat> the observation is uh, taking an infrared um, uh, radiometer and pointing it as zenith from the surface into space. And uh, what I observed was back in the 70s, when I would do this just as a lark, I wanted to see what the temperature of space was. Uh, we were getting something on the order of minus 70 centigrade. And now for some research that you and I might discuss later on because your uh, cloud reflection is something that I've been doing uh, for light pollution uh, lately. Uh, we are getting clear sky radiometer temperatures of about minus 20 to minus 30 in that um, almost 50 year span. And so I'm wondering why, why the temperatures seem to warm over that period of time. So, so where, does, where does the weighting function of your, of your IR measurement peak? What, what altitudes are you really looking at? You know, I'd have to look at that, but I figure it's up uh, above the stratosphere. Well, I, you know, I, I, I certainly would not expect what, what that the effects that we're seeing from water vapor or excuse me from uh, uh, say CO2 um, on the on the temperatures in the mesosphere you know we're, we're talking a degree per decade or something like that so um, so I would not expect necessarily for you to be seeing something so large not I mean I'm assuming that this is in a over a decade that you're talking something like no that. over 50 years oh over 50 years. Oh, yeah, from, uh, from 1970 to oh, 20. But you're seeing a warming, whereas we're seeing a cooling. The CO2 uh, is going to cause cooling in the mesosphere, not warming. So if you're really looking at the mesosphere, this could not explain it. Okay, just wondering. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Cora? Or did yeah. everyone thoroughly understand inner hemispheric coupling? Actually, in the chat, it looks like David Kasoy explained what kinds of disturbances are associated with gravity waves um, in terms of uh, like what is actually causing them. Um, you would get like weather fronts would cause them. Um, uh, you know, like I said, I think hurricanes, something like that, thunderstorms would cause them, wind over, over mountains. The polar vortex itself actually will generate um, uh, gravity waves. Um, I think that's what you were asking. Um, uh, uh, Cora, uh, yes. Joachim Kuttner, if you remember uh, that name, he was a very famous uh, space scientist and uh, uh, atmospheric scientist. Uh, he and I uh, explored the effect of uh, cumulus clouds and cumulonimbus clouds. Uh, to form gravity waves that would propagate upwards. So um, uh, mesoscale convective uh, systems, right. uh, tropical uh, depressions, uh, all create very high. Uh, and actually we, uh, uh, Douglas Lilly and I explored with the ER-2, uh, an aircraft you may be familiar with, the NASA high altitude. Uh, we explored that. Um, uh, Joan Alexander did a beautiful analysis of these uh, where uh, you could actually see these uh, turrets as they break through the stratosphere, uh, create gravity waves, which sometimes broke, but sometimes uh, didn't. Uh, I'm going to be getting in touch with you again, <laughs> Cora. <laughs> yeah. It's time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically turbulence in the troposphere is going to is going to generate gravity waves.
we do have a couple of questions. Um, Louis Navarro, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. How does solar storm effects in the global wind circulation and temperature affects the, formula, the formation of PMCs? How does solar storm effects in the global wind circulation and temperature affects the formation uh, okay, of PMCs? Okay, yeah, if yeah any? that's an interesting question. Okay, so, so the, the question I think is, you know, if we have a solar storm um, uh, and if it uh, impacts the um, circulation of the atmosphere, how might that then feed back onto the uh, um, formation of PMCs? And I would say right now, um, uh, there might be some direct solar impacts like from a, uh, uh, say, solar proton event on the mesosphere that actually might, might directly do some, um, you know, a little bit of heating of the mesosphere or thermosphere. Um, but we have not seen um, large enough heating to really cause significant effects on the polar mesospheric clouds. And the other kinds of indirect effects that I was talking about, where you actually have the particles, the uh, electrons or protons coming in, affecting the, the uh, you know, descending in the vortex and then changing the stratospheric temperature and stuff, those I think would have basically no, um, no significant effect on the PMCs at all. It's, it, the effects are lower down. Okay, you showed, uh, Andy Jacobson asked, you showed daisies from SIPs over the North Pole. Are things the same over the South Pole? Is there any difference between the two poles? Um, yes, so you do see uh, polar mesospheric clouds over the South Pole um, during the summer uh, season in the Southern Hemisphere. So we see uh, cl polar mesospheric clouds in the Northern Hemisphere from you know late May through August. We see them in the Southern Hemisphere through late November through February, actually mid-February. Usually the clouds in the Southern Hemisphere are less uh, frequent or dimmer than in the Northern Hemisphere uh, because the overall temperatures tend to be not quite as cold in the Southern Hemisphere than in the Northern Hemisphere. And that has to do with the overall circulation and, and really the altitude of where the mesopause is in the two hemispheres. Okay, we've got Terry Cook asking, how do increases, increasing temperatures in the Arctic, I think she's referring to the surface, interact with the effects of increasing mesospheric CO2 and methane with respect to PMCs? Do they amplify, partially cancel each other? The increasing temperatures interact with the effects of increasing CO2 with respect to so, so in other words, how does global warming say, or Arctic warming at the surface interact with the effects? Oh, um, okay, so, so the, um, the warming at the surface will not directly impact the uh, mesosphere. The way that, that climate change impacts the mesosphere is through these emissions of CO2 and CH4. So, so really the, I would say, you know, there's not really a direct, uh, you know, conduction, say, of the, of the heat from the troposphere up through the mesosphere. Instead, the, the real um, uh, effects of anthropogenic activities on the mesosphere come from the, the emissions of the CO2 and CH4. So, so I would say my, my answer to this is that, is that they are probably not intertwined like you're thinking. Um. Well, that was all the questions. So I'll ask one that I just typed in the chat. And assuming that there were not polar mesosphere clouds prior to Krakatoa, which I think is a small assumption, might they eventually fade away at some point, provided we don't have any more eruptions or rocket launches? So, okay, so assuming that they, that they really were, that the first clouds really were produced by Krakatoa, Okay, so, right, so in other words, why, why wouldn't we have had clouds before Krakatoa? Okay, so, so Krakatoa was this huge eruption, right? Lots of water into the mesosphere, so we think it, it created clouds. But remember, they decreased after that. Then they started increasing with the Industrial Revolution. So, so as long as, you know, we, the mesosphere stays with the kinds of temperatures that we're talking now, um, and we are we still have some sort of water vapor up in the uh, mesosphere, which we we will have some because we have of course a whole hydrological cycle. Um, I would not expect 
the uh, the clouds to go away. I think that we would have to see the mesosphere warm up quite a bit um, to you know pre pre industrial conditions. Okay, thanks, Cora. Are there any other questions? I think that people are satisfied. If I can say a word or two here, <clears throat> as a as a major player in the uh, retired faculty association, we really appreciate the effort you made to explain a very complicated phenomenon. Uh, I'll, I'll send you some emails about my work on what's called thermomechanics, the interaction of energy with gases. I think the, the big, your big picture is basically that, but at, at very high altitudes where there's no continuum gas, you have to do everything with kinetic theory and statistical mechanics. But it's fascinating to hear your talk and I really appreciate the effort you made to participate in, in, our, in our program. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Cora, this was a very fascinating and fun seminar uh, <laughs> uh, from Oreo cookies to your songs. <laughs> and it was very educational. I, I certainly learned some uh, uh, interesting physics uh, and fascinating new research that you have uh, presented, I think, in a very uh, clear and, and, uh, and, and, and informative uh, but also a very um, fun way to do it. So thank you very much for what you've done. Uh, our, next, our next seminar will be announced on the website you registered from, and you will also get an email announcing it. So uh, after a very uh, fun evening, good night, everyone. <laughs>